Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hope you're having an amazing day. Later this year, we will see the launch of NVIDIA's RTX 40 series of graphics cards, and we already have a pretty great understanding as to the different specifications for the various SKUs. For example, the RTX 4090 will feature 18,432 CUDA cores, and this is going to be split across 144 streaming multiprocessors, or SMs, if you prefer. And we know this not only only because of various leaks from, well, leakers, but also because NVIDIA themselves got hacked and a lot of data was then, of course, dumped online. From various leakers, though, we've also known that the RTX 40 series of cards are going to be, well, let's just say pretty power hungry. I myself have been hearing 600 watts for the flagship SKUs and possibly up to 800, but this would be for more custom designs. And Cup of 7 Kimmy on Twitter has been leaking a plethora of data regarding NVIDIA over the past several months. I'll refer you to a tweet which emerged on the 1st of April 2022. Now, of course, it's imperative to realize that at the end of the day, this configuration could change prior to launch, as most likely we're going to see the launch of these cards September time, possibly a little later. But we can see that the 90 series of cards here with AD102-300 features 24 gigabytes of memory running at 24 Gbps and again 600 watts. But recently there was a follow-up tweet to this, AD102-300, which again is the RTX 4090. It still features 24 gigabytes of memory, however, Notice that the clock frequency of the memory itself has dropped from 24 down to just 21 Gbps. So this will be using GDDR6X memory. So while 24 Gbps, technically speaking, would be possible for NVIDIA to release, it would basically be pushing the specification of the memory to its absolute breaking point, its limits. So you would basically need to cherry pick memory modules which would be capable of this, basically the cream of the crop. It's also possible, and I'm guessing here, that there could be other considerations too, like we know that the cards already are hitting pretty high temperatures. So for example, the memory temperatures on the GPUs themselves could be a problem, power consumption, or perhaps even just availability, or maybe NVIDIA just didn't think that long-term they would have a good failure rate. Maybe long-term they figured that the failure rates of the cards or another reason could be a contributing factor here. Now, ultimately, I'm pretty sure that we as users could overclock the memory, of course. So, of course, with overclocking, your mileage will vary. However, I'm going to be very interested to see if we were to get an RTX 4090 SKU and overclock it, how much of a difference would that actually be? Because another reason that NVIDIA may have chosen to go with lower memory clock frequencies is that the performance wasn't really affected that much. Remember, RTX 40, aka Lovelace, does have a more robust caching system, and I'm sure there'll be a plethora of other technologies as well, which improves things like data compression. Keeping on the subject of graphics cards for a moment, I want to touch on another very interesting thing concerning Intel's graphics cards. Now, at the moment, Intel have had, let's say, a series of delays for its first generation of Arc products, but when they finally do launch for desktop, they're going to be targeting roughly RTX 3070 to RTX 3080 levels of performance. So yeah, it's not certainly going to be competing with the likes of RX 7000 series from AMD or indeed, of course, the RTX 40 series from NVIDIA in terms of the top end, you know, the best cards. But for the first generation anyway, Intel's strategy is basically just to get their foot in the door and launch a product which should be competitive in the lower end, in, in kind of the market segment where, let's face it, gamers would want to most likely purchase a product. So Intel themselves kind of did an oopsie by releasing a test driver, and in that test driver was a ton of information which probably shouldn't have been uh, made available to the public. And what we learned about there is some details for Battle Mage, which is one of Intel's future architectures. You can read the configuration from Redfire yourself as he did a rather nice comparison versus the first generation of uh, Intel GPUs. With 1T, 
2t and 4t basically representing the number of tiles or chiplets if you prefer for a different configuration so yes it does seem that a battle mage will actually be a chiplet uh, design and I had actually mentioned this in a couple of videos previously so it's interesting that Intel have confirmed it here well I say confirmed in quote unquote because until it's officially announced yeah yeah well we'll just wait and see after all we actually thought all of the hopper skews were going to be um mcm and obviously that's not turned out to be the case although allegedly there are still skews in the hopper lineup which will be mcm but yeah until nvidia confirm it it's not it's just monolithic Either way, we are looking at a significant performance increase over the first generation of Arc. With 2T, for example, we have 10,240 FP32 ALUs. This is going to be about a two and a half times increase. This would put it potentially in a very competitive position against AMD and NVIDIA's current offerings. Although Intel will be a later to the game. Now, personally, I've heard that Intel want to get the second generation of products out onto the market as quickly as possible. I've heard they may be targeting around nine months after the first generation of Arc launches. But the thing is, I'm not so sure about that because the first generation of Arc has simply been delayed so many times. So that could either be that the second generation comes out much sooner, or it could be that these issues continue to trickle down to the second generation so that could also mean that that generation is also delayed as well for the first generation of arc it's not just the hardware although i am hearing that's coming along relatively well it's much better than it was say six months ago but it's also other things as well like the drivers We've already seen some Intel Arc GPUs tested. These are the lower performance uh, laptop products. And honestly, the performance is not too good. And it's very unstable, basically, depending upon the game that's being tested and other things too. And again, this does kind of match with what I was hearing um, a couple of months ago. This is back when I was hearing that Intel for the desktop products was considering actually launching them into even Q3. But obviously Intel in public have now said that that's not going to be the case, that they are going to be launching desktop in Q2. And I really hope they do because ultimately I do want the competition in the marketplace. Like AMD and Nvidia are both releasing excellent products for their next generation, but I really want as much competition as possible, particularly for the lower end initially, because again, that's where most people kind of want to put their money because many people obviously just can't throw down like 1500 bucks, 2000 bucks on a graphics card. And the final story for today, just real quick, Brad Sams has on his YouTube channel mentioned that Microsoft will be releasing a new version of the Xbox Series X, or more accurately, it will be utilizing a different variant of its chip. And now to be clear here, he's not referring to increased specifications almost certainly. So for example, it's not going to have additional compute units, the GPU isn't going to run at higher clock frequencies or the CPU or what have you. Instead, most likely we're looking at a revision to increase the efficiency of the chip, i.e. reduce power consumption, heat output, and perhaps also make it just easier to manufacture. So currently, uh, Xbox is using TSMC's 7NM process, as are, of course, Sony, AMD for a ton of their products, and so on and so on. Now, back in May 2019, the CEO of uh, TSMC, he was also the vice chairman as well, mentioned that they believe that most 7NM clients will eventually transition to the 6NM process um, of the company. Now, it is also possible that we're not looking here at, say, a revision, which is not necessarily based on a different process. Basically, they've just tweaked the design or perhaps manufacturing of the chip itself, which again can just improve the overall efficiency. We may also see small internal revisions to the system as well, which would coincide with this. For example, maybe small tweaks to the airflow of the system or what have you, just to basically make it either cheaper to produce for Microsoft 
or just to make it cooler or whatever Microsoft feels is best. We've seen the same thing for the PlayStation 5 quite recently, and ultimately it's very typical for just about every console generation, right? Like, there have been so many revisions of the Xbox 360, or, you know, even going back as far as, say, the, uh, you know, the original Genesis or Mega Drive, if you prefer, or the Super Nintendo, and so on and so on. So, this is not almost certainly going to be like a slimline version of the console or higher specification version of the console. Instead, it's probable that, let's say, that you went out to the store tomorrow and you picked up this console, you probably would not even realize it. Like, it would, it's most likely going to even be a kind of thing where you don't even notice externally that something has changed. I mean, maybe they'll have a slightly different position air vent or something like that. But it's quite interesting anyway that we're already seeing this. And uh, I still think that uh, Microsoft at this stage are already looking at like their next console. And uh, obviously I've released a video that Sony are working on the PlayStation 5 Pro as well. So I think it's gonna be a very interesting time in the console landscape. With that said, thank you very much for checking out the video and I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.